Thank you very much. Um, really nice to be here. Uh, thanks so much for uh, hosting uh, the project. Um, I'm Brandon LaBelle, and uh, well, this is the first session of the Impossible School. So we plan uh, four, uh, four meetings, four sessions over this year. So there'll be the next one in May, and then we'll continue again in the fall with two more. So I hope that, the, I mean, I hope the, the school itself or the project and the, the gatherings uh, that we plan can also become sort of generative and can become collaborative. So I'm very much interested in seeing what emerges as we move along and also for me to also maybe learn a little bit, you know, of some of the issues or practices or um, communities that are present here in the city. So I hope uh, this can turn into a conversation more as we go along. But to begin with, I thought it would be helpful to uh, just present myself and to invite some colleagues and friends to also give input uh, tomorrow, for instance, as a way to, as a way to begin. Yeah. So I really appreciate you coming and thanks for, uh, thanks for your attention. Um, I can say something a little bit that, um, I mean, the Impossible School as an initiative, as an idea, is also part of a larger project that I'm involved with called Communities and Movement. And Communities and Movement is a sort of artistic research project, so it's very much connected to exploring and reflecting upon different kinds of practices, different kinds of creative, critical, collaborative practices that of course intersect with questions of community and notions of community practice or how we practice community. And of course, part of that is to sort of interrogate, to play with, to question and to rethink and think together about what community is, what we mean by community, what community could signify within our contemporary environments. Um, so this is a, a topic, a framework for a discussion and also moving into different kinds of practices. Yeah. Um, the name, of course, also Communities in Movement, is taken from Stavros Stavridis. Uh, some of you might be familiar with his writings, uh, based in Athens as an architect, urban theorist, who has been writing quite a lot about common space, what he calls common space and commoning practices. And the notion of Communities in Movement that he sort of puts forward, really emerged also through his experiences in Athens over the last 10 years now, uh, and the movement of the squares that, of course, many of you are also familiar with. So his experiences there really, in a way, led him to start to identify and kind of theorize uh, what he felt was emerging around him uh, in terms of a different kind of sense of community. Uh, so communities and movement became a sort of, um, yeah, a, a phrase to capture a little bit what he was experiencing and what he was perceiving. And one of the key, I guess, observations or descriptions that he puts forward is around the notion of the threshold. So he talks very much about communities and movement as being porous communities, less about fortification, less about gathering around sort of um, commonalities really, gathering around identities or like shared identity, and actually something much more porous, much more connective, much more complicated maybe. And uh, so he starts to sort of pursue this through the notion of the threshold, the idea of the, the edge of things. Community is something that isn't necessarily centered around a single identity, but actually exists on the edge of identity, it exists, sort of hovers around and gains much of its energy by occupying this edge, which is always, of course, in touch with something outside of itself. You know? So maybe it's a kind of network. I'm not sure we can think about that. 
So communities and movement for me was very inspiring uh, as a notion and connects very much to some of my own, my own work as an artist and some of the things that I've been also thinking about and writing about, primarily from the context of sound studies and sonic practice. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit sort of my home uh, base, we might say, is to sort of address these topics through questions of sound, through questions of listening, also questions of voice, and what those things offer or enable. So um, I guess continuing a little bit along with that, uh, I wanted basically today to share, share with you some uh, of my sort of current thinking, current research, current uh, work uh, around what I'm calling acoustic justice. Uh, so the notion of acoustic justice is something I'm sort of mapping out, uh, thinking through, and also, of course, uh, bringing into different contexts, uh, artistic contexts, um, academic contexts, um, and trying to unpack that in different ways. So I wanted to sort of just share with you and kind of map out a little bit this notion that I'm thinking through. And I hope that this can also yeah, trigger some, some thinking, some reflections that we can discuss at the end. Yeah. Um, I can say that uh, acoustic justice, of course, starts very much around the notion of acoustics. So I start thinking about acoustics um, as a topic and also what I've been calling social acoustics. Uh, so I can say a little bit more about that. I mean, I think kind of like putting acoustics uh, at the center for me, sort of putting that out as a, as a base, as a ground, um, starts to, for me, sort of enable certain kinds of movements, certain kinds of reflections around what I always think about as the relationalities that sound sort of enables. And that has always been a little bit my, my concentration. Thinking about sound is very much about relationships, very much about uh, a generator, a medium um, for relationships, uh, for conversations, of course. So identifying and concentrating on acoustics, for me, has enabled a little bit more traction to this idea of the relationality of sound. So I'll, I'll sort of expand on that. Um, and of course, it's also been very tied to some of the work I've been doing around sonic agency, thinking about agency by way of sound, by way of the volumes that we work through in order to punctuate a sense of enactment onto the world, um, how listening enables us to develop types of uh, collaborations, of course, uh, types of empowerment uh, captured by way of sound and listening. So sonic agency has been something very central also to my work and I've tried to also shift that a little bit through the framework of acoustics um, which for me really starts to also complicate a little bit the notion of agency, the notion of sonic agency. So I could say that quickly uh, as a sort of shortcut if we understand listening as being about giving attention, about almost an economy of attention, then acoustics is what we do to facilitate that attention. Yeah. So again, listening as something that is about attention and acoustics is something about, in a way, setting the arrangements in place for that attention to happen. So I'll elaborate on that. Also, I think alongside that, as an, I think as an artist in my own work, which has been very much centered around sound and sound practices, I've also been in a way wanting to shift the whole discussion or the whole relationship to how we understand sound practice as being less about producing a sound, less about concentrating on a sound object, and more about addressing the conditions by which people come together. So in a way, understanding acoustics as a larger framework that is about sound, but also about something else, which is maybe more about the social arrangements uh, within which sounds occur. Yeah. 
So again, maybe about context, about the conditions that facilitate a certain event of sound you know, or an event of listening. So I've been in a way less interested as an artist to think that I am producing sound and more about thinking about the construction of certain arrangements. So maybe just to kind of move forward a little bit with that, maybe it helps to start very basically with the notion of acoustics. What is acoustics? What do I mean when I say acoustics? Uh, what are the traditions of acoustics? Uh, so, of course, acoustics is fundamentally a type of practice, a type of study. Acoustics as the study of sound, which is often very much about the physics of sound. How sound as a medium, as a phenomenon, is operating. What are, what are the behaviors of sound? And then acoustics also, as, as we know, very much tied to questions of architecture and questions of the built environment. So acoustic design, yeah. the design of acoustic spaces is very much central to how we understand acoustics. So we might think about this room as an acoustic space. Um, so how is sound, how is sound operating in this room? You know, how is it responding? to the acoustic dynamics of the architecture. Uh, so this is always, of course, embedded in how we understand acoustics. And this is very much how I'm sort of, in a way, starting and interested to engage with acoustics as a question of the physics of sound, but also as a question of design and the built environment. Uh, so immediately I could say that, of course, acoustics is, in a way, aimed at facilitating the movement of sound. If we think about architecture, if we think about acoustic decisions that go into architecture, are very much about facilitating the movement of sound. You know? How my voice might travel to you in the back of the room. You know? This is immediately an acoustic question. You know? So we could say that acoustics also impacts on what we hear. You know? We start thinking that acoustics facilitates the movement of sound. What are the acoustic decisions that allow certain sounds to be heard? Um, acoustic decisions, acoustic uh, discussions, uh, acoustic design strategies, in a way very much shape what we hear in our environments, uh, or at least impact on them. So this immediately can be thought about then as a question really to say what are the acoustic norms that are governing those decisions? Uh, what are the acoustic norms that are allowing my voice or not to be heard in this room? What are the acoustic arrangements that have been in place that allows me to speak today? Um, so this is kind of how I'm starting to follow acoustics. Um, and this, you could say, immediately intersects with, uh, at least for me, it's been very helpful to intersect and to consider uh, the writings of Jacques Ranciere and his notions of the distribution of the sensible, yeah. how he defines the political around this notion of the distribution of the sensible. What are the things that are apparent to us in the world around us? So, and what are the regimes of power that allow those things to be apparent. Uh, so the distribution of the sensible that Ranciere maps out is very much understanding a relationship between the political and power and the things, again, that enter the field of the sensible. So the sensible, of course, is also a question of what we hear. Yeah. So I start then really from, in a way you could say, somehow, posing acoustics as a political question. Um, and in a way, it helps then to think acoustics as essentially the distribution of the herd, yeah? the distribution of the things that we hear. Yeah? We understand that. Acoustics as a certain kind of apparatus or a certain like regime of norms or a structure, again, that in a way is, um, is shaping 
the distribution of what we hear. Uh, so this is sort of, in a way, my, my proposition, in a way. Which, of course, really then poses many questions, or at least is a very, for me, a very generative starting point to then think very much about sound and listening, and also about questions of attention, this economy of attention that we are, in a way, enacting right now. Um, these things, sort of thinking them and understanding them within this framework of acoustics. Yeah? The distribution of the heard, but also the distribution of the felt. Yeah? If we think about sound also as a feeling, as a vibration, yeah? as an atmosphere, yeah? as a kind of affective relationality. Yeah? So there's maybe sort of two interesting points to reflect upon two terms that often circulate within the field of acoustics, um, and that is uh, the topic of fidelity and also reflection. These are kind of two terms um, that we might sort of look at a little bit more closely. For instance, often within concert hall design, concert halls being very dramatic acoustic spaces where a lot of acoustic decisions are being played out. You know. Within that environment, fidelity, the notion of fidelity, is often about what we can think of as staying true to certain sounds. You know. if we think about fidelity as remaining faithful, you know. remaining faithful to certain sounds. So for instance, we can understand how in concert hall design, one may build a space, one may acoustically shape that space in order to enhance uh, our ability to hear certain instruments. Yeah, that we might hear, in a way, the orchestra or the sort of symphonic work. We may receive that, in a way, in a very truthful manner. Yeah. So concert hall design is very focused on allowing us to, of course, hear and appreciate the music in its full, in its fullness, in its complexity. Therefore, eliminating things like distortion, things like coloration, uh, and also thinking very much about the entire audience, of course, and how the, that sound, how that music can be distributed yeah, to everyone almost on an equal level. Uh -huh. So fidelity is often directed then by certain acoustic norms. For instance, within the kind of Western classical tradition, it has become sort of a sort of standard, really, in concert hall design architecture, that one aims for a two-second reverberation time. Yeah. Uh, and this is sort of understood to both, in a way, retain, and sort of like create a sense of immersion, reverberation being, in a way, that sort of, that sort of movement of sound that surrounds us. You know, again, if we think about the reverberant qualities of this room, uh, creating a sense of immersion is very key to concert hall experience, yeah, that we feel that we're immersed in the music. Yeah. But at the same time, only so much. Yeah. Too much, of course, then becomes a problem. You also want to retain clarity. Yeah. So it's about balancing between clarity and immersion. Therefore, two seconds of reverberation has in a way become a certain unspoken, uh, standard. Yeah. And immediately, of course, along with this, you have the question of reflection, you have the question of reverberation. Yeah. And again, we can think maybe reflection as a giving traction to certain sounds, giving traction to sound, that sound is able to move yeah, according to reflection. Yeah. And again, what are the acoustic norms surrounding that? Yeah. How much can a sound move within two seconds? Yeah. Uh, becomes a kind of interesting uh, question. What sounds within those two seconds of reflection end up dominating over others? Yeah. What sounds have a little bit more traction over others? Yeah. So there's maybe some interesting questions to ask. You know, one would be fidelity uh, in a way to what? What are we remaining faithful to? What are, what are we focusing on in staying true to sounds within an environment? 
and also reflection then reflection for whom you know who are we reflecting uh, or in a sense what are we giving traction to you know? and in a sense also who are we addressing in giving traction to those to those sounds you know how do we understand the audience in a sense within the concert hall situation so you can say of course that what's happening is that acoustics is constructing certain listening habits you know? it's participating in constructing certain listening habits which we then often could say carry with us out of the concert hall you know? to also then lead to ideas about value you know what is a good sound and what is a bad sound within a concert hall situation you know we can also think about things like clear sound and then also dirty sound you know we all know the idea of high fidelity you probably had a hi-fi system at home at some point hi-fi stereo system yeah I mean what is hi-fi and what is lo-fi we know how these also carry certain value we know very much around the dedication to the lo-fi is also a kind of ethos you know it reflects a certain attitude to be lo-fi as opposed to hi-fi carries a certain cultural uh, meaning to it so I kind of want to hang on to that, that sense that we have about acoustics to also think about how acoustics impacts onto bodies, impacts onto feelings of belonging, to possibilities of having conversation. Um, in a way, you know, to understand acoustics is very much something we work at. Yeah, we work at acoustics to also facilitate or to engage in types of sociality. You know? How do we reach each other? You know? um, we could say. So I really then in a way want to understand acoustics maybe a little bit following with some of Judith Butler's thinking around performativity uh, to think acoustic performativity. You know? <coughs> to think uh, again acoustics as a question of subjectivity and how subjectivity works through the sort of social, political conditions or conditions of power, how we work through those acoustically speaking, yeah, by essentially modulating the distribution of the herd. How do we interrupt the distribution of the herd? Yeah. How do we interrupt an acoustic norm yeah, in order to allow a certain acoustic community to emerge so then somehow from there I want to think through acoustics as a practice yeah. thinking about acoustic practices we might think and from here somehow also shifting a little bit away from the concert hall away from understanding acoustics as a professional practice um, as a kind of expert knowledge and to sort of bring it down to the everyday and to think acoustics in our own environments and our own behaviors how do we practice how are we practicing acoustics uh, within our daily environments yeah. so I sort of want to follow that a little bit acoustics within everyday life and there's maybe three or four frameworks or acoustic practices that we could think about um, Starting, I think, very simply uh, with uh, this this gesture, um, or maybe it's like that. If I do it backwards, uh, I don't know if anybody still has knobs. Uh, you're probably more like tapping things now. But the moment of reaching down to turn up the volume, you know, on your stereo, on your whatever device, this gesture, this desire, this wish for more. Yeah. I really appreciate this moment as a practice. Yeah. Uh, turning up the volume yeah. or of course turning it down. Yeah. This is in a way already an acoustic practice. This is already a question of modulating volume. Yeah. So silence and noise of course are very dramatic uh, sonic, acoustic figures. Yeah. Um, that we are actively involved with, I think. 
uh, within our daily life. We're always contending with and negotiating volume. Yeah? And we're participating in that, in the construction of types of volume. Yeah? Uh, so this already immediately, I think, starts to suggest what I'm, what I'm thinking about with acoustic practice. And we could maybe follow this then from making quiet or intensifying the herd. Uh, we can maybe follow this also into, for instance, questions about rhythm. If we think about rhythm as a framework of acoustic practices. And we could start by understanding rhythm very much as being the establishment of a pattern. Yeah. Rhythm is basically the establishment of a pattern. Yeah. It is about synchronization and desynchronization. What are the patterns that we follow? What are the patterns that we fall in line with? And what are the ones that we break away from? What patterns do we through which we find ourselves or other patterns through which we we sort of try to negate or step away from. You know? And um, I mean there's a lovely uh, collection of lectures by Roland Barth that was published some years ago. Some of his last lectures under the book uh, How to Live Together, uh, which maybe some of you know this collection. And in there he has some wonderful reflections about rhythm and one of the things that really stood out is he, uh, the statement he made, which is that, you know, one of the first things that power does is establish a rhythm. You know? And uh, so I think if we start thinking rhythm from that perspective, we can also think about how we negotiate rhythm. Yeah? How we, in a way, um, again, synchronize, but also desynchronize, or how we try to adjust the rhythms around us, or negotiate them. Yeah. Maybe you have a feeling for what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, we can maybe come back to it if we need more examples. Um, um, so, continuing then, I think it's also very interesting to think about vibration. Vibration is also a framework for acoustic practice. Um, and somehow I want to just start like posing vibration as being understood as a um, an ecology of feeling. If we understand vibration as an ecology of feeling, so vibration is of course something that, in a way, we feel. Yeah, it addresses the body as a materiality. Yeah, if I put my hand on the table and I feel uh, something coming up the table leg, uh, a kind of energy that's here on the table. We know in a way that that vibration, that energy sort of just continues along my arm. Yeah. It just unites me to the table. Yeah. There's no discrimination. Vibration doesn't make any discrimination between bodies and, and objects, between subjects and objects. Yeah. And vibration is then something we feel, we sense with the body. Vibration addresses us as bodies. And I think a nice way to understand this ecology of feeling is through the idea of hospitality. Yeah. If we think, for instance, here in this room, things have been set up to welcome, to welcome us. Um, there's a there's a construction, there's an arrangement put into place. There's a gesture of hospitality yeah. that in a way has certain languages, certain vocabularies, but it is also a, f a question of sense, yeah. a sensual atmosphere uh, that we feel uh, as a gesture of welcome. So we all know the wonderful phrase, uh, this place has a good vibe. This place has a bad vibe. Yeah. So I think vibration is very much about these tonalities of place, yeah. these ecologies of feeling uh, around us that we participate in, that we move through, we also move away from, uh, on a very unconscious, sensual level, sensing 
these ecologies of feeling and how I find myself in them or, or not. Uh -huh. So if anybody, of course, likes to go to dance clubs, you also know these ecologies of feeling. It's a whole environment yeah, of vibration that one enters. Yeah. Um, so I like to think about vibration in that sense, about hospitality, tonalities of place, the construction of an ecology of feeling as a kind of living, a living kind of entity that is constituted by many things. You know, whether the chair is put there, whether the juice is on the table, the lighting is just so. Uh, these are all gestures that, con that sort of contribute to this ecology of feeling. Yeah. So thinking that as an acoustic practice, yeah. I think, is also to address us as listeners, but also as sensual bodies. Yeah. Vibration, of course, is very much connected to sound. Yeah. And then finally, we might think about echo. I also like echo as a, an acoustic practice. And maybe one way to enter that is through the idea of uh, language performativity, or the acquisition of language, uh, maybe leading us a little bit back to Judith Butler. Um, so we can really ask ourselves, you know, where does language come from? Uh, how do we how do we learn language? Uh, of course, a very dramatic way in which we learn it is by repeating the words. Yeah. Right. We can only learn language by someone telling us how to speak. You know, I tell you, uh, you know, my name is, you know, and then you try to repeat this phrase. So this kind of moment of echo, this moment of repeating, of repetition, of playing back, of mimicking another in order to acquire language, for me is, very, is a very interesting complex gesture, complex performativity you know, that I think can be very much thought through around this notion of acoustics uh, that I'm sort of playing with and thinking through. Yeah. Enactment and maybe also reenactment, yeah. this kind of mimicry. Yeah. And also, of course, that moment in which you know, the echo also turns into, into itself. So echo is also, in a way, maybe with vibration, I think very much about commonality, about almost a, a commoning you know, vibration. Again, something that uh, unifies bodies and objects. You know, thinking about the dance club, there's always that wonderful euphoric moment of feeling yourself as part of everyone else. Yeah, it's a kind of like unifying ecology, vibration. Whereas echo is maybe also more about differentiation. You know? I repeat the words only in so far as I can use them for myself. You know? That it helps me become myself. It helps me to individuate. You know? I take this language and through it I figure myself you know, as an individual, as a subject. You know? So differentiation I think is also central to echo as an acoustic practice. Yeah. So maybe you get the feeling of how I'm posing acoustics as the distribution of the herd, as a question about certain kinds of practices that also enable us to negotiate certain kinds of acoustic norms, certain kind of um, uh, tonalities of place. Yeah how we, in a way, intervene within economies of attention. Yeah. Where do we put our attention? How do we modulate that attention? Uh, how is attention put on to me, for instance? To ultimately maybe allow us to explore modes of attuning and detuning. Yeah. Attuning to others, detuning to others, yeah. or maybe even retuning uh, environments. Yeah. So, um, just continuing a little bit more, uh, I just want to finish um, by also complicating a little bit 
the story or elaborating it in a different direction, which is to say, in a way, maybe going back to some of my original introductory comments about the difference between sound and acoustics, the difference between the sound object and the arrangements that allow that sound object to occur. I then also want to kind of shift from ideas of hearing to ideas of orientation. If we think acoustics in a way as I'm kind of maybe suggesting already, as very much about questions of sociality, about again, facilitating certain types of behavior, yeah, certain economies of attention. So acoustics then also about, you know, which is often very much tied to questions of orientation. If we think, um, I don't know if any of you have spent time with um, a blind individual, um, but we see immediately acoustics as a question of orientation, uh, how one registers you know, one's place within an acoustic environment through, um, through hearing the reflections, yeah, mostly. Yeah. Sensing the reflections, you know, if we close our eyes, we can, you know, and we walk around the space very carefully, um, I think we can immediately sense the changing of the dimensions of rooms, for instance. We know the dimensions of a space by hearing our voice in it. Um, so we orient ourselves, you know, like bats, um, orienting ourselves, acoustically speaking. So acoustics is also very much impacting upon our sense of place, our sense of being a body in a space. Um, and we can maybe explore this also thinking about experiences of vertigo. If any of you have suffered from vertigo, you know, as, as this moment of dizziness. Um, you know, vertigo immediately, of course, is a question about balance and a question of the inner ear. Uh, so we know how the inner ear is very much contributing and enabling uh, our sense of balance. It's very central um, to balancing. Yeah. And if there's a kind of buildup of fluid or calcium particles, uh, we can experience vertigo. It's, it can be a real problem. So we can see immediately how the ear is not always a question of listening, yeah, but more about balance and orientation. So I think by like shifting the discussion really from sound to acoustics, from listening to orientation, I think something else starts to happen. Something starts to emerge that I think can be very helpful, very interesting. <laughs> Again, to think about how we engage um, with our place in certain communities, our place within certain environments. So maybe one way to unpack that, I mean, I've been very appreciative of um, the writing of Sarah Ahmed and her book, Queer Phenomenology, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and I can maybe just give a quick kind of reading of that work, because essentially the work is very much about orientation, or what she calls the work of reorientation. Yeah. So she sort of starts, of course, by mapping out traditions of phenomenology, sort of philosophical traditions of phenomenology, which really in a way posits and reflects upon questions of being a body in the world, yeah, sort of phenomenological. Uh, reflection about appreciating and focusing on the corporeality, yeah, our sort of sensual, corporeal, experiential uh, situatedness. Yeah, so that my experience of being a body sitting in this chair in this phenomenological moment, you know, leads me to very much appreciate and consider all the different materialities that contribute to that feeling, you know, to that sense of body, bodily orientation, you know. How do I figure myself uh, within this material situation, you know, the sensual, experiential, experiential moment. You know. So phenomenology sort of allows us or enables us to engage on that level 
Yeah, being a body in the world, surrounded by particular material substances, constructs, uh, sensations. So, for instance, you know, I mean, she talks very much about tables in a wonderful way in the book. So I think one way to think about it is also in this moment, you know, if I think about this table in front of me, you know, one of the things that Sarah tries to remind us about, phenomenologically speaking, is how we also find support from the materials around us. So appreciating, you know, the table as participating in this moment of me being in front of you in this phenomenological moment. You know, the table really also assisting me, participating and contributing to my ability to be here in front of you, uh, to also somehow find um, the capacity to speak to you. Uh, the table, in a way, you know, supports my paper, puts it just where I need it, uh, the table also, also offers me a certain kind of barrier. Uh, it gives me support yeah, in this moment of vulnerability, <laughs> yeah, this moment of performance. Yeah. So how I find support from the things around me. Yeah. This is very essential, and very central to her, her argument about phenomenology. She sort of reminds us of that. Yeah being a body in the world and the supports that we find. Yeah. Um, but one key moment then is where she also reminds phenomenology of not only this material object as being a thing in itself, but also all the different decisions, all the economies, all the systems that have brought this table here today. Yeah. The table didn't just come from nowhere. Yeah. Someone put it here. Yeah. Um, so before I arrive as a f body, before I find myself here, there has been many decisions prior to my arrival that enables me to sit here before you. Yeah. So what are all those decisions? What are all those economies? All those struggles? You know, where did this wood come from? You know, all that genealogy all that history yeah, that is supporting me right now. Yeah, and I know nothing about it. Yeah. I'm just in my phenomenological moment. Yeah. So she tries to upset, of course, phenomenology, or just kind of remind phenomenology of the situatedness of being a body, of being contextualized. Yeah. Um, and also reminding the body and oneself that I am also a particular body. Yeah. I am not just material, but I am, of course, cultured. I am trained as a body. I, am, I, I, I carry a lot of things uh, along with my body yeah, that has also shaped, shaped this body. Um, so it's kind of leading us into this complicated phenomenology, this queer phenomenology. Also for Sarah, is very much about upsetting what she calls straightening up. Yeah. So queer phenomenology on one hand is more generally about queering phenomenology, about upsetting, reminding phenomenology of all these situated qualities, but also about queer identity and understanding how phenomenology is of, often forgetting the ways in which sort of heteronormative social constructs are also influencing how I sit here before you. Yeah. So we can also say that I, I somehow also take up my place in this social moment and I also straighten myself up. Yeah. I also participate in a certain normative structure uh, that is phenomenological but also contextualized within a particular social order that often also asks me to, as she says, follow in line, yeah. follow the straight line. Yeah. Um, so her project is also very much about queering phenomenology on that level, 
to also allow for a certain kind of um, what she calls straying, straying from the straight line. So we might even think about what she calls leaning slantwise or veering off course. Yeah. So, you know, if we sort of, you know, don't straighten up, if I somehow take a different position, if I rearrange the room, yeah, if I upset the different kinds of normative decisions that have gone into shaping our environments, if I kind of queer, queer these decisions, I also work at different forms of orientation. Yeah. So phenomenology, as she's posing, is also, again, about not only being a body in a chair, in a table, but also how those things are also orienting me a certain way. Uh, it's orienting me to sit in front of you, straightening up, participating in a certain social order, however flexible that is, still there is a certain moment of behaving uh, in a certain line, behaving, following a certain line. Yeah. Now, of course, what she finally does is sort of suggest in this queered moment, in this queering of phenomenology, to also encourage and give support to the work of reorientation. So how do we reorient the ways in which we are oriented in the world? So this for me was very helpful in thinking about acoustics and thinking about maybe what we could call a queer acoustics in terms of how we upset or work around the ways in which acoustics orients us. Uh, again, what are the acoustic norms, the acoustic decisions that allow me to hear sound in a certain way and also to make sound in a certain way, yeah, to participate in a certain kind of um, acoustic principle. So finally, I mean, this may, we may arrive then at what I'm thinking about with acoustic justice, um, which is a very, somehow very big term in a way. But I'm also, again, going back to the ways in which acoustics can be understood as a kind of everyday practice, a kind of work of reorientation. So what are, again, what are the, how might we, or what are the things that we do already or may do to also enable the work of reorientation, to enable certain voices or certain desires or certain behaviors to find traction, um, to upset a certain distribution of the herd in order to allow other things to be heard, for instance. All of these gestures I'm starting to elaborate or think about as a, as a gesture of acoustic justice, as a kind of working at acoustic justice. Yeah. So I'm sort of um, just there for the moment and uh, trying to unpack that a bit further. But it is something very much I thought about coming here and, uh, you know, um, that I want to bring forward and offer to this uh, framework of the impossible school and the discussions that we might have here. Um, also, again, around questions about self-organization, questions about the arrangements we make to speak and to listen to each other as being, as being very central to ideas of community or ideas of practicing community. So we can also think about what are the acoustics surrounding, for instance, scenes of democracy. Yeah. What is an acoustics that enables understandings of enacting democratic procedure, for instance? Or what are the acoustics we might identify within other kinds of environments? You know, ac the acoustics of educational environments, for instance. The acoustics of other different kinds of communities that we may be part of. Sort of putting that sort of acoustic frame uh, over these different spatial, environmental, social situations to also think a little bit about how sound and listening and the work of orientation or reorientation may be enabled. Uh, 
these are the these are the sort of questions or propositions I'm I'm sort of working out. You know? So maybe I, I can I can stop there. Um,